um, Dr. Uzodima Iweala to interrogate some of the underlying issues behind this recent call um, about the situation in Nigeria. Dr. Uzodima Iweala is Chief Executive Officer of the Africa Center, a culture and policy institution in New York City, in the United States. Dr. Iweala, thank you for joining us and welcome to this Live, the Sunday talk show. Well, I'm not hearing Dr. Iweala. I, was, I think I was okay. on mute. Thank you very much for having me, yeah, Dr. Abbas. I can hear you now. Thank you for joining me. Well, quickly, I read your piece that you wrote in the uh, uh, July-August edition of Foreign Affairs, an American policy uh, think tank uh, publication, titled Nigeria's Second Independence, Why the Giant of Africa Needs to Start Over. Now, I've read some reports here in Nigeria saying that you are calling for the dissolution of Nigeria. But when I read that piece, I thought you were talking about reforms. Okay, but don't let me summarize your own article uh, to you about what you think about your country and about its immediate future. What exactly do you mean by Nigeria's second independence and how we should start over in the context of preparations for 2023? Sure. Thank you very much, Dr. Abbas, for the, for the chance to be on your program. Um, look, you know, I think sometimes some people take things completely out of context. But what I was really talking about when I wrote the article for Foreign Affairs magazine um, is thinking through what are the roots of the democracy that we have here in, in Nigeria, I should say in Nigeria, and what are the, what's the genesis of the union that we have. And if we want to build a better Nigeria, if we want to build a better country, a more robust country where everyone can participate in our democracy, where everyone actually has the chance to dictate or push how decisions are made, then I think we need to go back to basics and think historically, as well as, you know, in the looking at the, the way that things are currently structured, and then also think about what traditions, what historical traditions, what sort of things inform the way that we want to construct our, our democracy going forward, again, for maximum participation. That's what the article really takes a look at. So I dive deep into the history, uh, how Nigeria's democracy actually comes out of a colonial presence, um, both in terms of resistance and in terms of its, its actual drawing on so many of those the colonial structures from before, and then look at how that has informed the way that our democracy is shaped presently, and then think a little bit about how we can actually you know, change things, uh, I think, drawing in very much on a younger generation of people to push a new kind of democracy, very much locally grown and forward looking for the future. Yeah, but uh, you said Nigeria is not a democracy constructed for the benefit of the people, that it is a quasi authoritarian state. How do you mean? So, I think it's really interesting to look at the political structures here, but you know, Nigeria, in very similarly, I think to France, almost runs what you could call an imperial presidency. Um, that's the first thing, and I think the second thing you could look at, um, and when I say imperial presidency, I mean that there's a lot of power centered in the executive. The, the executive has a lot of power to dictate, to inform, and that's whether you're at the the national level or the sub national level. It has a lot of power to dictate and, and inform how things happen within. Uh, its purview. Now, if you look at um, also going forward in terms of participation in sort of the democratic uh, structures, you know, you're looking at in terms of the last election about 35% of population or 33% of population, that's a third of, of, of uh, voting eligible people. So that are making decisions. Is that really uh, a democracy if that few people are voting. And then you look at sentiment as well, whether people are saying, will this democracy actually, do we really feel that, that participating actually changes things? And again, you get low numbers in terms of people's sentiments and thoughts about democracies. So that's the first thing um, that you just think about within the present. But then going back and you look at some of the structures, again, the way that government was set up in Nigeria, um, it seems like, again, from the research that I've done, comes out of these, these colonial structures, which were set up, essentially they are authoritarian structures, right? The, the ultimate authoritarian machine was the colonial enterprise. It was not one that took into account the opinions of the people. It was not one that was structured for the benefit of your average Nigerian. It was structured for extraction. And I think in large part, we have seen those structures, even if they are 
cloaked in the language or the, the, the sort of philosophy of democracy, some of those structures are still maintained today. And that shuts out the vast majority of Nigerians who I think would like to participate in a real way um, and shape the future of the country. Well, you want a shift from the old Western paradigm and you talk about the possibility of a new Nigeria. Uh, what is right. that new Nigeria that you envision? Uh, a federal system? or what? Uh, because you also talked about uh, the idea of a unicorn, a democratically inclined uh, leader. We've been searching for that uh, democratically inclined leader forever. So what are those specific things? Yeah, I, I, do, I do talk about this idea of a unicorn. Um, you know, in, in startup culture, right, they talk about the unicorn as a particular kind of, com of company that returns, I think, or has a billion dollar valuation. And we can think about the unicorn in the political sense as that person who who is, is the one singular figure, the hero, I think, that we're all looking for. We're looking for someone to take Nigeria on a hero's journey, one person to bear the burdens for all of us as Nigerian citizens, whether we're in Nigeria or in the diaspora, and make, you know, Nigeria, transform Nigeria. And I'm, what I'm saying is that there is no one person who is perfect enough to be able to do that, who, can, who has the, the, the command and control and the ability to appeal to everyone popularly, but at the same time to make the tough decisions necessary to transform the country. And so if you're searching for that kind of person, you'll be searching forever. And meanwhile, the structures of government will disintegrate around you. And I think that's what we've seen. So rather than that, I think you need to take a, a hardcore look at those structures and see how can we and enhance some of these structures, change some of the structures where necessary um, to, to, to make it possible so that it's not just one person, it's not the hero that we're looking for that will benefit Nigeria, but that it's all of us that will participate and also then transform the country. That's the first point. I think the second part of, of your question, just to answer that, is really, you know, in a, in a sense, do we, should we be looking to, to take some of these models? We talk about federal this or, you know, confederation that. The question is, how many of these models come out of traditions that we truly understand ourselves, right? That people feel comfortable participating in. There's a lot of grafting in from other places. And I think that's good, right? No country exists in isolation. No place is a, is a kingdom unto itself. So you look at where things have been done in other parts of the world. But at the same time, I think we need to look at our own traditions and how they've informed the way that decisions are made and, and evolve and adapt those in a way that people then feel familiar, fundamentally familiar with the structures that they are participating in governance wise. In practical terms, in your article, you were recommending that voting age should be reduced to 16. Well, here in Nigeria, well, you live in the United States, but here, in Nigeria, a 16-year-old will still be considered a child, you know. Sure. And the Constitution says the age of consent is 18. Uh, you want 50% uh, affirmative action for women, which is okay. And then you condemn the geriatric uh, rule. Uh, but you talked about our tradition, what fits into our system. But here it's considered, you know, uh, old age is uh, considered synonymous uh, with uh, wisdom. Uh, do you think that these are practical ideas and uh, whether that will solve a problem? Because somebody was saying the other day that even young people in Nigeria are the ones doing uh, 419. Uh, it's not, mm. that, uh, it's not uh, automatic that they are better than those you refer to as geriatrics. Right, let me tackle those one by one. And I'll, I'll start with the last one first by saying that I have ultimate respect for our elders. There's so much wisdom that comes from those who have gone before us. Um, who've experienced the world before us, and there's so much to learn from them. So let me put that point out there. I'll come back to that. The, the second thing I want to tackle is the idea of 50% affirmative action for women. I don't think that this should, should even be a question or a thing. 50%, in fact, slightly over 50% of our population, I think, um, is th in Nigeria is, is, are women. And how can you claim that you have a democracy if those folks are not actually represented in full force in government, right? So I, I, again, I should say that this is not a Nigeria-specific problem. This is a global problem, right, where patriarchal structures try to shut women out of, of their ability to, to participate in actual governance. So it's not Nigeria-specific, but I think if we're really thinking about what democracy means, you can't run a democracy where 50% of the population doesn't have a say. I think in, right now we're looking at seven or so ministers that are women. We're looking at, um, I think, uh, seven or so or maybe eight senators that are women, 
Um, and then, uh, you know, a, a, a larger number of representatives, but proportionally still very small within the context of our, our, our population. That's not, that doesn't work. And when you think about it, that representation is so important because the way that you think about certain problems, whether it's around, uh, you know, economic problems, the structure of society in terms of caregiving, you know, social benefits, all that sort of stuff, your debate changes. And that's crucial that that sort of openness of debate is crucial for any kind of functioning or functional democracy. So that's that's a certain point. Again, I'm, I haven't forgotten on the on the, the geriatric thing, and I, I make sure, want to make sure I address that. But to go to the first thing about um, voting age population again. I would say that this is not Nigeria specific. Um, you know, in many countries, the age of voting is 18 or older. But I would say that we need to pay particularly a particular attention to this, not just in Nigeria, but across the continent of Africa, where you have countries, you know, the, where the, the, the median age essentially is 19 or so, um, where you're talking about life expectancy that's about 54, and we can talk about exactly what goes into calculating life expectancy. But if you think about it, the the that's the, the and then the third thing here is the challenges that we're going to face whether you're talking about things like climate migration etc those people who are in their 70s 80s are not actually going to be the ones who face the 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 aftermath of some of these massive transformations that we're going to see so why should we say that those people who are younger who are actually going to spend more time dealing with these challenges who are going to have to come up with the solutions solutions for these challenges shouldn't have a say in government now, especially when, and yes, 16 might be a child, but if you think about the way, the amount of pressure that we put on uh, folks who are that age, what's expected of them in terms of their behavior, um, so many 16-year-olds, younger folks in, in Nigeria across the, the, the country are expected to take on adult tasks. Why should we not have those people then and trust that set of people with the way that, uh, with participation in democracy and also governance? So that's, that's and, and, and I believe very strongly in that, again, not just in Nigeria, but around the world. You can't have people who are going to be, not going to be here in the next 5, 10, 15 years making decisions that might disrupt the lives of people who will be here for a good 70 years. Years or so. That doesn't seem fair to me and doesn't seem very democratic. Now, to go back to the first point, which is about uh, geriatric rule, you know, again, for the way that I talk about it is that I don't think that people should be locked out of participation. So yes, one should be able to vote. But again, when it comes to decision making, should we not think about whether or not we should cap the age of participation? I do not believe, as much as I respect our elders, I don't necessarily believe that age and wisdom are synonymous. Um, and I think that's across the board, nor, nor, nor do I believe that youth and open-mindedness are synonymous. I think, you know, it is an individual thing, but, uh, uh, you know, at the, at the same time, I think we need to take a look at, you know, again, that, that major question of who is making decisions for who. And, you know, if you look at the track record over the last you know, X years or so, I don't necessarily know that with an older crop of leaders, we've necessarily made the wise decisions that will benefit the youth of, of Nigeria or again, across the continent. So you can't have, whether in Nigeria or the United States or wherever, you can't have a whole set of people shaping the world for them so that they have the most luxurious or beneficial 10, 15 years left in terms of their lives at the expense of the person who's going to now have to deal with that for, you know, 40, 50, 60, 70 years. It just doesn't seem to work for me. And that's why I argue that you should lower the voting age, uh, increase the number of younger people who are participating in the democracy. And then, you know, like, again, think about capping the age for participation in the offices of state so that you're, you're shifting responsibility towards that generation that will actually deal with the challenges. Okay, Dr. Weala, that, that's a section of your essay which I find very interesting, where you talked about the Buari record. And I read that, okay, you scored him low in terms of what he's been able to do with the economy, but I thought that you were generally uh, too generous. Um, mm. What are those successes that you were celebrating, more or less, in my view, in, in that piece? Look, I think I'll leave the, the commentary uh, specifically on, for folks who are most impacted. As you said, I'm outside of the country. And so I'm coming out with what I'm hoping to be an impartial lens as we talk about the structures of our democracy. I think one of the things that's, that's most troubling to me and to a lot of people, obviously, about what's going on is that feeling of insecurity, that feeling that makes people feel that they're not safe. And you can see it in the news reports all over. And that's a really problematic thing for people's one, again, participation in government, 
um, and sorry, in the process of, 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 of government and part process of, of democracy, um, and two, just for people's livelihoods. And I think, you know, that, that sentiment is not one that I've expressed alone. I think it's one that people have seen um, and been expressing over and over and over again, that sense of insecurity that leads it to an ability to, to conduct commerce, to feel safe in your own home, to feel safe in your own church or place of worship, mosque, wherever, what have you. I think that's a really, really big problem. And that's something that we need to really sit down and think about, not just now, but as we go forward into, you know, thinking about who becomes or who, who holds office in Nigeria going forward. How do we hold people accountable? How do we feel, uh, get them to understand that one of the primary things that we need as Nigerians, whether you're in the country or as, as you're a diaspora person looking out and having to talk about your country to people outside, how do we make sure that we're, we're, we feel safe, number one? The second part about this is how do we then ensure that people from outside take a look at um, the country and have a positive image of what it is that we're doing. You can't, again, project a negative image and then expect things to change, uh, you know, for business, for economics, for travel, all that sort of stuff. You know, again, when people see such a, such, you know, see some of these negative things and again, think about safety, security as their primary concern, as opposed to the dynamism and the, 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 the intelligence and the, the prowess of Nigerians. And that's something that I think about when we talk about the record and what people have felt over the last few years. Okay, just two quick questions, and we'll wrap this up so that we can have uh, further discussions on this program. One, what are your expectations as Nigeria prepares for another general election in 2023? And then if you can tell us briefly about your work as the chief executive officer of the Africa Center since 2019. Sure. So to tackle the first question, which is the harder one, I think that it's really important, one, for that people feel safe and able to actually participate in the democracy that we currently have. That's the first thing. People need to feel like they're able to vote. People need to feel like they have a real say in picking the leaders, that it's not a selection, that it actually is an election in the truest sense of the term, right? So that that's the first step. So that the second step is that we can actually have some of the real conversations that we need to about how our democracy is structured. As, as folks will see if they read the piece, I don't necessarily believe that it's structured for the benefit of all Nigerians. But in order to have the conversation about that, we need to have a system at least that is somewhat free, somewhat fair, and that is actually somewhat participatory rather than selective. And I think that's something that we really need to talk about for whatever party it is that comes into power, you know, 2023 and beyond. Um, and that's at the national level, at the subnational level, and of course, right down to the local government levels and structures. That is so important. That participation is so important. And, you know, I think we as citizens of the country need to step up, but at the same time, those who hold office and who are in charge of running these elections need to really think about holding themselves to account even as we try to hold them to account um, in that in that process and that's what I want for Nigeria just I want one for a safe election but two also for maximum participation so that we can shift the trajectory of the country um, then in terms of what we do at the Africa Center to tackle your second question we're a multidisciplinary institution that's really focused on the again trying to transform the narrative around the continent of Africa its people its diaspora it's really about having those conversations that that are show the complexity of who we are as Africans whether we're Nigerians Ethiopians Kenyans Gabonese whatever um, and the contributions that we have made that often go ignored to the world at large Africa has been central the continent and its people have been central to so much of what is happening, and yet we're pushed to the side, whether we're talking about the economic development of other places because of resources that were extracted, both human and otherwise material, um, whether it's philosophically, what we've done, whether it's scientifically, so many of those things have been pushed to the background. Um, and yet the world would not function without us. And that's what our center is here, both to push and also to celebrate. And that's something that we need the participation of all people, whether we're in Nigeria or across the continent, just bringing ideas to the fore, bringing their thoughts, their comments, their discussions, visions for the future of our continent in our various countries. Um, and, and also much, much more importantly, raising our voices as some of our entertainers, as some of our sports figures, some of our politicians have done to the world stage so that we can really transform the discussion about who we are and show our true brilliance. Well, thank you very much, Dr. Izotima Iweala. I know you are also a novelist, but today is not about literature. 
Okay, <laughs> but I've been privileged to have read uh, Beast of No Nation. Uh, well, thank, thank you, you very much indeed for joining us.